This is the Amp Hour Podcast. Released March 25th, 2024. Episode 663. Motors on PCBs with Carl Bugea. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. Hi, I'm Carl Bugeo. Um, I'm an engineer from Modelo. Hey, Carl, how are you? Hi, Chris. It's good to chat with you. I I have to imagine as you're sitting in your lab right now, like when I imagine you in your lab, it's just like flexure circuits, just like going in the background, like <laughs> a, like almost like cuckoo clocks and like, you know, just kind of like they're just flat, everything's flapping and electronically <laughs> actuated. Is is that correct or not? Um, sometimes it is, yeah. Yeah, okay, all right, all right. The sounds really <laughs> gets to my head, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I guess we, we would probably hear it. Those are not quiet machines that you build. Um, not all of them. Some are quiet. It depends on the speed that you run them okay. um, with. Um, yeah. But they can be quiet. But to test their durability, you have to test them at like um, 20 hertz. So mm-hmm. they, uh, if it's hitting something, it can get a little bit noisy. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's, it's already in the audible range, and you know, start getting up into the sixty hertz and above, and you start to hear it pretty easily, huh? Have you have you created like you know like how they do the um, hard drive musical things? Have you have you tried that where you have like multiple flappy things going at different different frequencies to try and like make a little orchestra? Yeah, that that's a little. Um, I haven't uh, I haven't done that yet, but I I coming soon from Carl. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting to test out. Yeah, well, that's great. So people should, uh, I guess we should state up front. You have a wonderful YouTube channel, one of my favorite YouTube channels, where you do experiments, or like flex circuits and electronics and things like that. And I reached out to you because you started selling some of your creations recently as well, and I wanted to talk about that and just your history and kind of everything you've built. How did you How did you get started in this space? So um, to start from the beginning, I graduated from university um, as an electronics engineer. So it's kind of my line of work. And um, all my life, I basically like to tinker um, with wood, with electronics and building stuff. So it's kind of my hobby and building robots. Um, so that's that's kind of my, it's sort of my work, but it's also my pe- passion. And on, on my YouTube channel, I started experimenting with PCB motors and PCB actuators. And f- almost, I think now it's been five years <laughs> doing this thing. And it's finally um, progressed um, into something that um, can actually be turned into kits or products. Um, and <laughs> it's been a little bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. And I mean, that is a big switch over too, where it's like moving from experiments to productization. It's like, yeah, uh, that's, and I think this, uh, one thing I, I thought about immediately is just like the, you know, you, you document a lot of your, your trials and tribulations and failures. And, and I love that you do that, but I'm not sure that someone purchasing a kit is going to be as, <laughs> as forgiving and be like, I bought this thing from Carl and it doesn't work. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, you got to yeah. try it out. You got to try different things, you know? Yeah, I we we do um, a lot of testing before because it's it, it, from a prototype to a product. There is a huge difference. Um, you need to, to so, for example, for my flappers, I had to make sure that they don't break after some time and do all this testing related to that. I mean, it's easy just to make a YouTube video and show, look, this thing work, and then there it's a whole different spectrum than selling something i think yeah yeah well and so uh, what is the new company called the new so where you're selling this stuff my our website was i'm doing it with my cousin it's called the microbots.io um and the aim is so we're sort of phase one where we're like releasing um actuators and um, hopefully soon there will also be PCB motors. So the first step is like getting um, the actuators and motors to work reliably and um, good. And hopefully the, um, the stage two is integrating them into robots and displays 
So we're also working on some cool interactive displays. I mean, some actuators are already like, like the flapper. I mean, um, it's already like um, been been through all um, our testing, and I, I I mean, so far I have no other ideas on how to improve it <laughs> further. So uh-huh, the next uh-huh. stage for that is um, integrating it into products, um, which we have multiple projects related to that on going that's great yeah no i I mean people can go to microbus.io right now and see kind of the i I really like that you actually have the coming soon too where you've you're teasing (laughs) the new stuff because then it allows people to kind of see it's almost like a quasi roadmap but then also like maybe pre-order and talk to you about if they have other ideas or hopefully give you money to help fund you know hardware's not cheap so (laughs) yeah Um, hardware's not cheap no but the main goal for the coming soon is just to show a little bit of what we're working on and um if someone is interested just um he can just put the, his email address and once we launch that product he will get notified so yeah how much do you have to deal with the public misunderstanding of like power delivery in like these motor type situations like do people like call you up and say like oh awesome i'm gonna like lift my car up with a you know a PCB actuated flap. <laughs> so every time I release a video, I, I, I receive a bunch of DC emails. Oh, no, um, really? Yeah. It's either that or either um, companies just want to collaborate or stuff of course, like that. Yeah. But I mean, our goal is just um, to to work on tiny, tiny motors and actuators. And yeah. I mean, it's... There are other companies that, for example, are working on PCB motors and integrating them into cars and stuff like that. But my goal, for example, with the PCB motor was always to make like uh, an easier to build and a a cheaper alternative than the other Mm -hmm. motor than um, what's available commercially that has um, the copper, the coil windings and stuff like that. It's it's easy to drift from the original goal because I I can go and make a bigger motor and have it be five um, x more efficient or, but our goal was always I mean ever since I started my YouTube channel was always to create a tiny motor um, that mm-hmm. can yeah. be used that I mean it, it's not an efficient motor but it's efficient enough to be used in robotics. Right. It won't uh, burn itself up is probably the, the most yeah. important thing in the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah. I feel like one of the problems too is just like popular culture. Like like when I see your stuff and just like these kind of like seemingly self-driven, I mean, obviously there's intelligence behind them. There's, you know, you're driving them yourself, whatever. But just this kind of like this realm of things, my mind jumps to like Big Hero 6. Did you ever watch <laughs> that movie from Pixar? Yeah. With like the actually Microbot. Microbots? What yeah. are they called? Nano? No, yeah. they called them something they, they like called, that. They called microbots. I mean, they were called like, microbots. Yeah, that, yeah. That and was, it's like, I think one of of the inspirations behind the name. Uh, um, nice. Because okay. we we considered like a couple of names, but I think because when it comes to PCB actuators, I mean, um, let's put it this way: if if you have um, just one actuator um it's it you need to have one pcb components for one but imagine having that same pcb multiplied by 10x yeah right so right. It, it's it's going to be the same the pcb um it's going to have the same price you're just going to pay extra for the component so that is one of our main things that we're working on so like so like efficiency of the solution because it's because pcb materials is a be- effectively um exactly. commodity at this point you can kind of start to expand using that yeah it's it's like i mean this is still an ongoing thing that we're currently working on and nothing is published yet but having one actuator or one mode or a school but what other applications could be created if you have like 10 motors on one mm-hmm. PCB? Yeah. Yep. So that's yep. some, some of the things that we're currently playing playing with. Yeah, yeah, totally. I just feel like the 
Big Hero 6 ruined my brain because I'm like, oh, yeah, tiny little microbots that are like, you know, self-powered and, you know, can self-assemble. It's just like, yeah, I mean, no. that, that, that would be pretty cool. But so far, so far, I think we, we have to focus on just one dimension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They might have taken a couple mental leaps in a animated film, yeah. I got to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're fighting a good fight. That's that's what's important. Let's talk about some of the, some of the realities of putting current through a PCB like this. Like, okay, so... Let's maybe paint a picture for people with okay. words. You know, we only have words here, but we're painting a picture. Someone's going to like, what is, what is your kind of common use case when you're thinking about, maybe we, we just talk about like the fat, flat, flat flap. <laughs> That's yeah. a tough one to say. The flat flap is like a, so it's like a flex PCB on top of a rigid PCB. Is that, is that what that is? Yeah. So it's, it's basically one flexible PCB that have um, aluminum stiffeners. Okay. It has two aluminum st- Three, sorry, which um, fold, which then folds the PCP together, um, has a pocket for a magnet, and the um, coil interacts with the magnet. Got it. Okay. And then is it there's a solid state magnet on there, or or no, or is it only? Yeah, it's, um, it's a normal. I mean, an an N fifty two magnet, uh-huh. so it's well, the highest grade of uh, magnet. So when the coil um, is energized, it's, ba- it's basically create a small magnetic field that is like strong enough to move the coil upwards. Got it. Okay. All right. And yeah, and so I'll, I'll link to the, you know, I'm going to have show notes here. I'll link to the, the actual product itself. But this is the one if people have seen you. your latest video where it's moving like a butterfly wing, like a printed butterfly wing. That's a great example there. So it's moving paper in that case. And you're showing it like a moving ping pong ball as well and some mirrors, that sort of thing. Yes. So far that it's one of the most popular applications for it is, is I think it's mostly used by artists. So um, yeah, like yeah. to create kind of sculptures and stuff like that. Got it. Okay. So then now we're talking about this sort of thing and what is the actual, like what is the current that's going through a coil to actually like make motion happen? So um, the current that um, it obviously depends on the voltage you run it at, um, but it's usually around um, 180 milliamps. Okay. So that is the constant um, if, if you drive it at constant power, um, because you can like generate small pulses to, to not overheat it and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's another good point then too. So like, what does it take? Like how do you have monitoring on board or do you just kind of have like a general knowledge of like, don't overdrive it past this point? Like how much do you have to like, if someone was implementing this specific thing, how much did they have to do it? How much do they have to like kind of tweak controls to make sure they don't burn it up or overdrive it or anything like that? And then how much, how much then would they have to do if they weren't using a product like yours? Yeah, so I mean, there there's obviously the main limitation is the temperature rating of the PCB, um, which is I think it's hundred thirty degrees Celsius. Okay. But on our website, we listed it as uh, five volts maximum. Okay. And that rating is derived from the resistance of the coil, um, because the coil itself has a DC resistance that is dependent on the length of the of the coil so depending on how many turns the coil has it it will increase the the length and it would will add a series re- resistance apart from inductance mm. okay so then it's just a geometry problem at that point like geometry times copper thickness kind of thing huh? yeah because it, it just depends on the number of turns and you can easily derive also the length and try to estimate it f- from mm. a couple of pcb calculators but i mean there there are other problems like because there's like the variation of the track width that the um, pcb manufacturer has um so we had to deal with that for example and other things mm. but that's that's mostly where where the power rating comes from okay and you said 130 for the pcb temp what what is that just the delamination how, how do you determine that as like a max temp so there is the tg value so for normal uh. pcbs it can go up for for example 270 degrees celsius and I think it's it's common practice to to like go to like thirty to forty degrees lower than that when operating PCBs at high temperature. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I you know I I've, I've never 
push the bounds with my stuff like that. You know, like yeah. I always just try and like give myself tons of operating margin. And it's like, by definition, you're trying to do it at, at the limits because it's like that you get more out of it in this way, right? Yeah. I think this is a, a very interesting field. I, I learned a lot from it when trying to build PCB heaters. So oh, yeah, the, I, the self-soldering circuit. I saw that one. Yeah. The self-soldering was like the last the last step. But before that, I, I, I tried to build like a PCB reflowing hot plate, uh-huh. um, which didn't work. I mean, it worked. There's, there's a lot of people um, trying them right now. But the main conclusion was that it wouldn't be reusable. So you, after like five times, uh, you you could see like the solder mask, the color and stuff like that. Uh, this is obviously when when the PCB reaches um, around 200 degrees Celsius, for example, just enough for the solder to reflow. Mm. Just need to start with like brown solder mask, and then you're you're set, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, I but don't I, see any discoloration. What's the problem here, folks? <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, after after that, um, I think it's it sort of proven the self reflowing PCB idea was sort of perfect because the PCB just had to reflow one time. It had to reach like um, 170 degrees Celsius for just one time, and then it's done because. It, it's a function of time as well. Like th- there's um, how how much uh, PCB can sustain heat. It's a function of time, yeah. and six minutes. It's like still okay for it. Got it. And then you so you also made one about flex PCBs too, because obviously you're you're doing this on rigid FR4, but then also flex. So then, like, how do you think about you know choosing project types between those two? Yeah, it it really depends on the nature of of the project. Um, if if there's, for example, um, something like mechanically where the flexible PCB can, for example, avoid wires or be like a little bit simpler. I mean, th- that's why I like to use flexible PCBs because it usually offers th- this kind of um, opportunity where you like instead of using wires i know i mean it's just wires but when you like consider producing hundreds of of this thing soldering wires one by one it's going to be a little bit of annoying (laughs) i feel like that that same like truism that like could be applied it's just wires it's it's just resistors it's it's just transistors it's just billions of transistors you know what i mean like it's just like yeah it's it's just turtles all the way down (laughs) yeah and i think it also looks neater (laughs) yeah yeah totally i i always think about um you know batch processing generally right like whenever this always comes up when people are talking about like, well, I want to make like a PCB robot, something that like draws traces on a PCB. And even if it was like perfect copper drawn onto a PCB, like perfectly conductive copper drawn onto a surface, right? That's like always what these PCB printers look like. It's like you're still rastering versus like batch processing. Just the the fact that you're doing batch etching on something like a flex PCB or a regular PCB, like that, that's one of the big advantages from my perspective of just like just the chemical element of it all mm-hmm. when you have to do any kind of like point to point or whatever, you know, however you define that, that, you know, raster kind of process, you, you almost immediately lose out to a batch processing. Exactly. Stamping versus milling, you know, there's always, always these sort of things. So it's just, then you really take advantage of a lot of the, a lot of the capabilities with, with that with flex. So that's, that's great. Okay. So now you're designing FR4 or flex coils. How much, how much math are you doing on a daily basis? Do you math? <laughs> I don't math anymore, Carl. I I know you're a little, a little closer to university days, but I am yeah. very far from my university days. And I don't yeah, math. me too. I mean, it's all, I mean, I think no. It it I'm I'm close at being ten years. <laughs> ten years? Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Because I graduated in 2016. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're getting there, huh? Yep. <laughs> so this how much year, do you do? So is it how much is it like experimental versus like? When's the last time you touched Maxwell's equations? How about that? <laughs> yeah. No, um, basically, I started as like doing, like it, it was like iterative. That, that's how it started. Then um, as as I, I started getting um, more in depth, I started trying to like estimate the perfect length to get the temperature right. Uh-huh. Um, because, for example, one of the things that a, a few people know is 
flexible PCBs, for example, will get hotter than FR4 PCBs because they have much less area and because they are super thin. So uh, the yeah. heat that the coil generates will transfer easily. Yeah. Like the heat capacity of the of the material and stuff like that. Exactly. As, yeah. As well. So there was like um, stuff like this, like for example, the tolerance of the manufacturer. That was one of the things that I didn't even consider in the beginning. Then when I started um, receiving batches of the same coil, dif- different manufacturing batches of the same coil with different resistance. Um, oh, obviously, interesting. There, there, there was a like. There's an extra problem that you have to solve yeah and how, how did you get into that did you start doing like incoming inspection and stuff like that yeah so what, what i started noticing is that if you were there at different batches i mean the manufacturer will either use a different factory or a different uh, machine or stuff like that so uh, th- there will be a tolerance and in, in even in the copper thickness there are some tolerances so but the main problem i think was the width so i was fortunate to to get to the root of this the my local university offered me to inspect it with the x-ray machine oh that's nice um so i could like measure the um, sort of not accurately measure but it, it was visible that there was um, a problem with the clearance between the copper traces copper windings oh really yeah. so so this was this was the trace to trace spacing because of like the etch process versus yeah. like the... so it's, it's like the, the pitch between the the tracks okay all right what what was the net result of that? Was that that was due to that was overheating? Yeah, I mean, there is not much you can do about it, but uh, you have to like tell to the manufacturer to measure the resistance and make sure that the same process and this or the same machine is used for different for the same orders and stuff like that. Got it. Got it. So when you send out a uh, a design, right? So you've you know you have sponsors in your your videos which is yeah. great and a lot of those are lower cost pcb services which many of which i use and love are you sending really well specified like pcb drawings then as well yeah i usually write the specifications on the pcb design file itself to make yeah. sure that um whoever is seeing the files before they get manufactured is yeah. well aware of w- what's being there yeah Got it. I just feel like when I, um, you know, when I was starting to use some of the lower cost PCB services, you know, as they were coming up, because I think they rose after I was making PCBs, I was just like, oh, they got this, no problem. But then it was like, you know, a couple of times I'm like, oh yeah, right, controlled impedance traces or yeah. like thicknesses, you know, like where it, it really, at the end of the day, it's you know, on us as like manufacturing engineers, effectively, like switching our hats from design engineering to manufacturing engineering it's like that incoming inspection and like giving feedback about process type stuff like you're dealing with it's just it becomes a whole other job you know yeah i mean it was the same for me um yeah because using like these these types of manufacturers some of them are good and some of them are bad right Um, so that's why i picked one and stayed stayed yep. with with right. them for a long time um but yeah, and i should I say mean, i'm not i'm not picking on the low cost services i think it's really that i because there's no way around it with like the traditional pcbs manufacturers like they, they yeah. won't accept the files without a drawing with it right whereas like you know low cost manufacturers are just like yeah you're using our process no big deal it's like for me i'm like oh yeah you still need to send the file with it right even if you're no matter who yeah. you're using that's that's the big catch that i'm getting at yeah and and i think i think they're they're improved quite a lot because now there's totally. the yeah. some advanced options and stuff like that so i don't usually get um a lot of problems um, fr- from their side now that everything is sorted out so that's great that's great so now you are moving into the manufacturing stage with with microbots and stuff like that yeah. do you now have more like test tooling in-house do you have to do that yeah, we do some testing, but the testing we're doing so far is making sure that the supplier um, sent us, like we're checking the supplier, sort of. So the PCB supplier. Okay, yeah, doing what they're saying they're doing, that sort of thing. Because obviously they do um, their testing as well, and we like to have to make sure that the quality of the the PCBs that they have sent us is yeah. to what we specified. Yeah, and I mean, I think you have an interesting like uh, new sector, not sector, uh, new 
characteristic that I, I've never actually had a test for before, which is like motion, right? Like <laughs> I've never had a, like a final test stage where I'm like, is this thing moving properly or not? But I would imagine you have to yeah. do that sort of thing. Are, are you, um, do you do that with like vision or just like. Yeah. So, so for example, with the flaps, it's, yeah, it's all yeah. has to do with, um, the resist with the quiz resistance, for example, if it's like, we check if, if it's in, um, within its specified range and if it's between that range, we know for sure that its motion will be correct. So we're using mm -hmm. like okay. the quiz DC resistance to check for its motion as well. And obviously we, we do also visual inspection and stuff like that. Mm hmm yeah to okay. make sure that for example the flexible pcb is not um banded like but like folded for example in, a, in the wrong manner or stuff like that right yeah i've just I, I imagine like like you have like the time flap which is like a new kind of persistence of vision thing and then like a robot as well that are coming and those kind yeah. of have all alternate like Again, like I've just never dealt anything with, with motion before as like a as a final test stage. That's an interesting thing. Yeah, so the time flap is one of the, I think one of the most the longest ongoing project that we have because I think it's it's been going on since I I released the first prototype and we're almost there. But um, the scary thing about it is producing like when you start thinking about producing hundreds of it mm -hmm. because yeah. mechanically the it it will it will affect the behavior of the of the screen. Yeah. Um, so we like introduce stuff into into it like um, automatic tuning of the frequency and stuff like that to oh, make sure that that the flap um, continues uh, flapping at the right speed. <laughs> um, it, it it goes a little bit complicated, but it's it's one of the um, fun projects we've been working on. The, the flap factor or the uh, yeah flappy, flappiness is that a <laughs> you need flappy so you need to make up your own terms to start branding around these sort of things. <laughs> <laughs> and we also That's think great. because after the engineering is finished there's like the the thing does it look nice in everyone's eye or or not then mm -hmm. there's those other aspects as well so <laughs> that's true yeah i guess uh, when you have like these visual elements like it's uh aesthetics you know, people always have, uh, I guess opinions are like, uh, belly buttons. Uh, everybody mm. has one. That's not the, yeah. not the original phrase, but, uh, <laughs> modified for family friendliness. Uh, <laughs> and like, yeah, so you just have to kind of do almost like user testing and just be like, this exactly. is like, okay enough to, to everyone that's. I think that's really important it. as well, because I mean, before you, you like, um, go with the, it's not a risk, but it's a, a huge like headache yeah. um, to release a product. So you you have to make sure that everything is on point. Yeah. Well, and even like, you know, you obviously you do a lot of videos and like you do your best to make, to be able to show it on video, which is not easy when it's a moving LED thing on its own, uh, you know, just like uh, frame rates and stuff like that. But then just matching people's expectations from seeing it on video versus seeing it in, yeah. in person. That's always tough too. Exactly. Yeah. What about, uh, so you also have like, you use a lot of drivers for these sort of things. I've used like some Allegro parts in the past, like drive circuits. What makes for a good drive circuit for motors or PCBs or things like it? Yeah. Um, so I've tested a lot of different drivers, but um, one of the main things that it's my number one priority is if the driver is small. So for example, um, in my last PCB motor video, I created like a custom fully driver, but the PCB was quite large compared to the motor. So for me, that doesn't make sense. So having like a one chip that could replace this all is, is like a bonus. Yeah. So I think size is, is since we're like creating tiny robotics and having like um, flat actuators and stuff like that, mm. I think size is the number one priority when it comes to drivers. I always think to myself, I'm like, well, it's like mostly an H bridge. I could like do it myself. <laughs> right? like, I could buy transistors and build it myself. It's like, 
that is generally the wrong idea, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> like you could, but should you, right? It's like kind of the other stuff that's in there. Yeah, I think all engineers um, go with this approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> until they until they get some shoot through and yeah. blow up a board, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, like how, how advanced are these chips at this point? Like are there... Are there additional features that are in these driver chips that, that you look for? Or, or is it just kind of a, uh, is it like you said, just size and, and just general um, efficiency? So f for the PCB motor, there's quite a number of chips that were available. I tested a bunch and just selected um, the one that performed the best. Um, so, um, but I mean, for the... Um, the driver of the actuator um, is it's just an age bridge really and then we created a, a library so that um, people can just use it to control the, the our actuators okay great um, yeah so the library it's, has it's has like an interface in front of it or, or no like a like a microcontroller in front of it or is it just just driving driving that specific um yeah, it's just um, drive a specific waveform. Um, we created multiple examples, so um, one of them can just be used with any Arduino. And then there's one that is more specific for the ASP family, um, because one of our um, next modules is going to have an ASP32 C3. So totally. it, it, it's, it integrates with that um, nicely. Regarding drivers, there's there's a ton of options for example age bridges there's a ton of options and like <laughs> if you if you like see these little chinese chips that are sort of like knockoffs there can be really cheap as well but i think you also have to select um as a safe option as well so yeah, something right. that that so that's one of the things that that we that we tested, for example, like there was a chip, a specific Chinese power chip that was like five times cheaper. But I mean, the data sheet <laughs> was in yeah. Chinese. Yeah. I mean, right, right, right. RDS on was not uh, specified in the data sheet. So there's stuff like this. That, <laughs> really? That, okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah, so, you get what you get, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> we recommend but, underdriving this chip. <laughs> I think you some so sometimes you also have to favor the quality rather than mm -hmm. having everything cheap. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like 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 you said with like building a library too, like having the knowledge of a particular family and just the knowing the corners of operation and where things could go wrong and maybe having that in your library so you are dealing with a very particular chip. It's not like just a generic it's not like an overall generic thing. It's more like specific to different drivers, right? Yeah. What about, um, so you have a project on your YouTube that's pretty great, the uh, little four-wheeled foldable robot. So like that as a as a project, which I think you might be selling in the future, is that right? Um, we're not 100% sure about it because, I mean, first we, we're, we're currently in the final stages of like um, finalizing the motor so um, once that is finalized we will take it like to the next step which would be um, to wield um, robots hopefully mm, got it. Um, and then we'll see um, we also test it out with the rover um, but the thing is that our goal is to create um, small um, robots that could interact with each other someday mm -hmm. and like to do that you have to bring the price of the robot to a, a very low price so having two wheels rather than four would be cheaper uh, right. right two fewer wheels is uh, you know savings <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one of um the things that we're still um exploring mm. okay yeah I, I am really i mean i'm amazed at some of the you know, some of the manufacturers that can do like those little uh, RF drone, you know, they, they give you like for like $20, they will send you like a little quadcopter with a remote and they like talk to each other, yeah. you know, they've got RF link and it's just like unbelievable that all that stuff can happen. I obviously it's a toy, but like that you can get that all working and it yeah, actually flies, you know, for 20 bucks. And that means they're making yeah. it for what, like four bucks, maybe, you know, like. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So in the case of that sort of thing, like, uh, so you have a controller on board there and that is then driving a couple of motor drivers that then actually drove, yeah. drive the, 
the coils that are on board, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, so the rover is, is was made from one flexible PCB that folded together to form like a cube shape and a cuboid shape, sorry. And then the, the wheels gets bolted onto the sides of the cuboid and it, it just um, drives. So it has PCB motors, so the stators are integrated into the PCB and that's and the magnets of the motor um, are integrated into the wheels themselves ah. i mean it, it it was a very fun project especially to design the final result i think was not that great but i think it can be improved in several ways yeah i mean and yeah well you said i mean it looks like that's a esp32 on there but you said you're switching to the c3 for certain yeah products. we're switching to the c3 i mean it, it's it's one of the most popular micro uh, microcontrollers um that has wi-fi and bluetooth i think the c3 answer five that's cool yeah it's cool i mean it really doesn't matter at all from like you know like other than like me saying it's five, it's like oh okay but it's still interact with it through code so and it works so it's cheaper yeah, and it's, it's package is, is yeah. really small as well yeah, um, yeah. so for us it, it hit all the right boxes so it it has a like an okay price it was it has one of the smallest packages available um and it's it's getting quite popular um with um arduino users so that that's why we went for it so because we would like to make it like uh, into a maker kit so uh, um, we want to make it as easy as possible for for people to use mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting are you so then are you developing when you're developing stuff for arduino in that case are you writing a new library or are you kind of piggybacking off existing libraries yeah um it's kind of um the two cases at the moment so we're using um, some libraries and we're also creating our own um things as well okay you doing any esp idf or anything like that um no not yet no okay yeah, I've dug into it a little bit. I'm I'm generally very impressed with how advanced the RTOS is. This, you know, just how it's progressed over time, and that's what I think is running under the hood for all the Arduino port as well. Is it's running ESP IDF under the hood? Okay, um, but it's you know it's more advanced, and I'm still struggling a little bit with it. You know, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's, that's nice. And then, so then, can you with the Arduino libraries that you use for it? Are you able to have then remote control? Like, what is the remote control look like are you actually you're actually using the bluetooth and wi-fi in order to control this thing yeah so for the rover um, i connected it to a playstation joystick and uh, it just connected through wi-fi but in the future I, I think we're also experimenting with the idea of connecting um esps together and using um one as the controller and one as the robot oh cool okay cool things like that <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, you could the um, ESP Link is I think they have like a pro, their own protocol as well. Yeah, I like think so. Link, that sort of thing. That's pretty fun. Any plans to internet connect it? Are you gonna make it so that you could rove rover around the around the, <laughs> the internet? Yeah, I think <laughs> it's like connected all, stuff to the internet, right? <laughs> all the things that's happening with ESP um, right now, there's the ESP Home, and I think all of that stuff is is quite interesting yeah. to look at. So yeah, yeah, we had Keith on the show from Nabucasa talking. Yeah, about I I and, heard the episode yeah. yesterday. Yeah, so maybe we'll put you two together and see what you know, little <laughs> little home rovers. That would yeah, be that's, that's, that's the jam thing. right there. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, how long until I get a little very, very tiny robot rover to fetch me a beer? That's that's what we really need. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's like the, uh, the classic robot thing, right? It's like getting a, <laughs> getting a soda or a beer out of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Spot will do that for you someday. Yeah, exactly. I think that's their goal right now to like go into the domestic things. Oh, the uh, Boston Dynamics and like their yeah. little electric dog. Yeah. As much as I, I have a friend that works there, and I love him to death. But uh, the uh, everything they do is creepy. <laughs> I'm so yeah. creeped out every time. I see, you know, it's always the uncanny valley with those because it's just they're moving into that space. It's just like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it's quite cool. The first thing that I've done after I graduated, um, I sent uh, my CV to them. <laughs> uh -huh. I said like this is my only chance. Um, 
if it's either this or um start like my own thing <laughs> and they, they never got back to me so and i just said yeah i guess you know what we need you to go make robots on youtube for everybody to check out so <laughs> that's good i mean that's the thing though too like i i love that you're doing this kind of stuff on youtube because it's just gonna i have to imagine people contact you who are up and coming through the space and they're just like yeah i want to build more stuff like you're building yeah i think that that's one of um the main rewards from making youtube videos you inspire others um especially mm-hmm. young makers and young students mm-hmm. um i mean receiving those kind of emails um is quite rewarding yeah that's great do you end up so do you have a, a did you build a community with this sort of thing as well then like where do where do people gather to wow to gather and agog over your uh, your creations and or build their own I think it's mostly through social media. So people um, who, who follow either my Instagram or my Twitter, <laughs> Twitter not that much lately, but uh, more Instagram. Well, I think. I'm sure there's, you know, you're making robots and I'm sure the bots love following you on Twitter. <laughs> 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 nice one. Uh, one of us. But, one but I mean, it, it's, it's mostly um, through Instagram and email. Yeah, um, okay, cool. That's great. It's nice, yeah. nice to see that. Do, have you seen like kind of follow along projects that are like like oh I saw Carl doing this and now I'm building my own? Do you get to see those as well? Yeah, I I do see some of them sometimes. It, I it's mean, it's, it's some of, of some of my builds are, are a little yeah. bit of ex, of expensive, and um, that's that's one of the main reasons why we we started Microbots to make them more accessible. Um, sure. So, yeah. So it it's a little bit like uh, I mean if if I was a student back in in my student years I, I mean I, I couldn't afford a flexible PCB or or I yeah. mean now they're much cheaper than than what they were before but that's, Yeah, I mean it's almost like everyone. standardized components at this point might as well get a jump start by using your stuff and then if they need to like Exactly. I don't know. I, I started building a robot at one point and like, I'm like, I need to build everything from the the ground up and build every like driver. And it's like, well, I could have gone to, was it Pinoco? There's like, there are a bunch of like DF robot and like, there's all these other sites too that like yeah. had these components. And I, sh- I should have started there and gotten the end robot working instead of you know, starting at the b- bottom up. Right. It's like the, you're at the point where you are optimizing for a very specific application, which makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. But like, as a beginner as i was it i shouldn't have started at the beginning there or i shouldn't start at the bottom yeah i think that that makes sense because it, it, i mean when i was a student i i, I was doing the same exact thing yes. um so that's the the main reason why these type of kits make sense yeah um, for us to build because um and sell just for others to either test out and perhaps inspire them to create something better Mm-hmm. and hopefully uh, they will yeah yeah that's great so you, after uni you you went out into the world as well like what did you end up what were you doing when you had gone out before before you started i guess in conjunction with you uh going out into the world or going into the world of youtube what, what were you designing when you were in the in the commercial space yeah so it's it's a bit of a i mean not a long story but um after I ended university, I I sent the CV to Boston Dynamics and I didn't go to reply from them. Uh-huh. Um, and so I started a startup with my friend. We were working on um, drones and uh-huh. Bluetooth tags. At the time, the drones were still like getting popular. So it made sense to, to go into that space. Um, but I mean, after a few months, like we couldn't fund it um, more because we are still like in the R&D stage and mm. it was going to take months or even years um, for us to turn it into from a prototype to a product because it wasn't just a quadcopter, it was a coaxial type of drone. So um, two okay. propeller drone, the, like the size of a, of a tennis ball. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a lot of control there, huh? Yeah. Like a lot of feedback and stuff like that. Exactly. Um, the, the main problem was um, manufacturing, I think, because... Uh-huh. 
it had like flaps um, and stuff like that. And when you compare it to a quadcopter, it, it, it's much easier to produce a uh-huh. quadcopter rather than a coaxial drone. Yeah, a lot, um, of, uh, a lot of margin in, in the quad. Yeah, and a lot right. of plastic things and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the time we didn't like we had a cheap 3D printer and uh-huh. the 3D printers were still like um, starting as well. Yeah. Um, then after after the start of failed, um, I went into the automotive industry. So I worked there for three and a half years, during which time I I was also um, doing YouTube videos as well. So. During this time, I, I was working on designing electronics um, for concept vehicles. So I, I did this for like six months, but then I, I was switched to to software. So I was doing like mainly software that goes into devices that connect with like the CAN network of a car and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Cool. I mean, Great. and I learned a lot from that experience um, because it... I mean the the products that they were making um they they were producing like thousands of them so I learned a lot from just the difference of producing one thing and producing 100,000 of that thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that that was quite a yeah a learning experience and that that was in Malta where you're based um is, yeah. is automotive big there what what is what yeah, are the industries no, there? not that there's only one company um, oh, okay. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's the company yeah. no, not one company and and um, it, it's just one company that designs electronics for automotive uh-huh. got it got it okay um, so it's called method electronics and cool. uh, i i was quite happy for some time then but yeah. then i mean covid hit and things were a little bit different and i decided to to try and switch full time on youtube and not just you, you just um, doing um, what I love doing. Um, yep. Just building electronics in my garage. That's great. <laughs> and yep. that, that worked pretty well, I think. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about just like what I, I was asking what Malta's like in terms of the electronics industry and stuff like that before the show as well. And it sounds like there's not a lot there, but there is stuff like, you know, like you, you've got some some folks, you know, in the town and, and stuff like that. And, yeah, so yeah. it's a... It's a pretty small island here um so you cross from one end to the other in like an hour so oh nice okay (laughs) it's quite small um but i mean i think the really important thing is like do the pc you know how's dhl service and how does you know how fast can you get a digikey box that's that's like my judgment you know okay okay. (laughs) and i guess how is import duties too that's another thing that, that i don't really think about here but it is even here i have to pay them you know they're just usually attached I mean, the only, I think the only um, postal service that sucks is UPS here. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's it's quite, because I have all my family here. So it's quite nice having to live here yeah. uh, and I don't see a reason so far to move to anywhere, anywhere else. <laughs> no, I think that's, that is really great. I mean, the fact that like, it's gotten so much easier to, to be able to, be a you know be a manufacturer on your own or just like send send off design files to have stuff just kind of remote assembled just thinking about like 20 30 years ago the services were there but they maybe the communication wasn't and um you know i think even just the industry of like being able to i think even things like shopify and like uh similar like marketplaces for selling gear it's just so much easier than it used to be you know there's yeah, logistics and online stuff all that stuff has really improved the ability to then manufacture somewhere locally in china somewhere else have a store of equipment have a store of uh, merchandise rather and then like being able to sell it you could potentially never touch the hardware if you wanted to and still have an electronic mm-hmm. business you know you just i mean the, i i think the word will we live in makes everything simpler to do something like this yeah um i it's not something that you, you would be able to do i think in the, in the early days yeah yeah it's definitely gotten a little a little better in that way so that's that's really nice yeah what uh what's on your 
as much as you're willing to share. What's on your like your project list uh, other than the stuff, you know, obviously people can go on microbots.io yeah. and see mm-hmm. kind of the coming soon or the 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 test stuff. But like what's the thing that you think about like, oh, I really I want to learn that or I want to build that. Like what's what's on your list of of things to to do with PCB actuators and motors and things like that. Where where's the, where's the future of this space? I think the the future is like find a simple way to control multiple actua- PCB actuators. So okay. actuators on the same PCB. Um, I, this is something I've been trying to do for, I think, the last one and a half years. So I've been re- researching a lot of different options out there. And I've always come to the same conclusion. And I think we're finally... Um, a step closer at, at, at doing that finally. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why we named it microbots and all, all that stuff. Um, because it's, it's the main goal. And does that mean like, uh, so is each coil going to have its own microcontroller? Like, I guess that's one thing you could do with low cost microcontrollers as well, but then programming becomes an issue. Like what is the, um, what, is, what is enabling that sort of thing to happen? Yeah, I think it's like, it's, I, I don't want to spoil too much, but okay. <laughs> the, the way the way we're thinking about it is like daisy chaining the coils. So got it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, even if you had like, so you have your plug and play controller, right? The Flexar, and that looks yeah. like that's you know a way to interface to these different things and like kind of abstract some of the difficulties. But then, do you have one per board, and you kind of pass the idea down the line? That's exactly. sort of like, it, it's, yeah. it stops making sense, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I've been playing with like low cost, like the CH32 V003s and stuff like that. And those are low cost. And maybe you could put a bunch of those on a board, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do, nor would it be fast to program that, right? It's still like a, it's almost just a, it's a scaling problem, right? Yeah. Because uh, I mean, there's, there's, so what I found, there's a lot of different options. And the problem is not just scaling, the problem is like the price per cell sort of so the okay. price sure. per one coil yeah because it, it it would be i mean you can do it with like uh, i mean just an age bridge um but you would have yeah. mul- a lot of wires but then once you solve the wires problem like how 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 expensive is it to drive one coil and if you find a driver that can drive multiple coils at once is it like cheap enough to make sense or or not? So that that's one of the main problems we've been trying to solve. Oh, interesting. And do you think it'd be possible to drive multiple? Maybe this is the thing you didn't want to talk about, but is it possible to drive more than one coil with a single driver to like start to again just drop the price per cell? Yeah, it, it is possible, but I mean that's um, not the way we decided to go because it compared to the solution we we're working on right now it's 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 it was it ended up being more expensive because Mm -hmm. the the type of drivers that can drive like six or 12 coils Mm -hmm. um still cost like eight euro when you you buy them in in hundreds or thousands so yeah it's their price like don't drop (laughs) right even though they're just one ic so yeah it's kind of interesting it's almost like you know like so obviously as ldvs were coming up right they started to think like oh well we could like use them as backlights for tvs and then over time like the reason tv like flat panel tvs are so expensive so cheap these days because they're effectively not printing but they're you know like the the array of an led tv is kind of the same problem where they're dropping the price per pixel right or you know whatever does a motor have a pixel equivalent like a not a voxel that's a that's something different is there a name for that a moxel pixel (laughs) Um, maxel you gotta come up with this you gotta coin this term carl i think you gotta you gotta make this thing you know i i mean i don't think there there is such a thing um yeah but in my mind it's just like they 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 solved that or they they had that similar problem where they they were trying to drive down the cost per pixel right they still needed to have individualized control over rgb for each pixel and then you know the schemes to do that sort of thing of like 
like a cross hatch or a daisy chain or similar, you know, kind of thing where you're you're trying to drive all this stuff at a high refresh rate and, and potentially high current. I mean, LEDs benefit from yeah. silicon improvements, but it's like similar. It feels kind of similar in that way if you're trying to make like a, a large array of, of these actuators. It is. I mean, it's it's like our main inspiration from it are like flip dot displays. And uh, yeah. w- one of, I think one of th- the main issues with them is that they are pricey. Yeah. Um, so that that's why, I mean, hopefully we won't go through the same thing or we, but I mean, Pacific Coils offers because they're pricey and they're bulky. Pacific Coils would at least offer the the cool thing that they're very thin so yeah right right they're yeah i'm looking at your pcb actuator based on the flex r which is basically it is i mean you could you have a configuration where it is basically it's got a googly eye that is a flip dot basically right yeah yeah well, well that's, that's what we all want we want we more googly eyes and flip dots in our lives I, I <laughs> We're working on making something like a display, a mechanical display that's much prettier than than the googly eye thingy. But hey, hey I love googly eyes, so don't <laughs> don't change it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Just nicer googly eyes. That's what we need, you know. <laughs> All right, more more googly eyes coming our way in 2024. We'll take uh, <laughs> yeah, Carl. Where can people find you online uh, and? Uh, how can they get in touch with you if they need to? So the easiest way to find me, I think, is through YouTube or Instagram. Um, and they can get in touch with me either via email or through the microbots.io website. Great. Well, thank you for stopping by and uh, and telling us about all this stuff. I think it's, you know, like you, you're, you're operating like on the edge of this stuff with the, you know, trying to push PCBs and flex PCBs to the edge of like what they can do. And just like, yeah. I really like how you show your experimentation you share that stuff you share like you know one thing that comes through from your videos is just that you do a ton of work to get one video done and it just really shines through so uh, thanks thanks for doing that because uh you're you're thank you very helping much. all of us yeah that means a lot <laughs> because it really <laughs> it really um does take out of effort so yeah, but hopefully a lot of, it's a lot will of pay off. yeah all right well thanks for thanks for stopping by carl we'll, we'll talk soon thank you very much for having me bye-bye